Brilliant. Thank you, Will. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final session of the Big Reboot Conference 2021. As Will has already said, we're joined tonight by Mark Buckingham. Now, Mark has had many hats over the years. His current hat is a performance partner at British Triathlon and a Level 3 Triathlon coach. Now, without sort of spoiling what Mark's going to chat through uh, today, he's a former international runner and switched to triathlon in 2010 as part of the tri goal scheme aimed to bring runners into triathlon. Over the last eight years or so, he's had huge amounts of success. He's been multiple British, triathlon, British champion, won multiple medals at World Triathlon Championships and featured at some of the biggest events in the triathlon and multi-sport calendar. In more recent years, Mark's been also a guide for Dave Ellis, the PTBI athlete, and in 2018 formed a remarkable partnership in that year as the pair became He's also been actively developing his coaching skills in recent, recent years, working with coaches at the Leeds Triathlon Centre and in 2018 completed the UK Sport Athlete to Coach course. Recently, Mark was named as one of the coaches who will be supporting Team England's triathlon team for next year's Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, just down the road. Now, as Will said, Mark is currently in sunnier climbs. He's in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it's just gone 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So we're not at all jealous, but... That's that all that aside. Mark, welcome to this evening. Good evening. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, yeah, and thanks for the intro, Gareth. Uh, as he said, I've, I've, I've literally just got off um, the bike on a chain gang. Uh, we're doing a month long high altitude uh, camp in Santa Fe uh, with the Brownlee brothers and um, two or three other training partners. Um, so, yeah, I'm a uh, Bear with me if I'm a little low on blood sugar and uh, and I start talking gobbledygook. But to give you um, just a brief um, background to um, in addition to what Gareth said, um, yeah, I, I was originally a, um, a runner. Um, I was a fellow mountain runner, then got into steeplechase running. Um, and I got on the world-class program with athletics uh, probably when I was about 17 or 18. And uh, off the back of that, went to America for three years on a scholarship. Got back from there with um, a bad navicular stress fracture. Um, my uh, physio at the time, Alison Rose, uh, could see that I hated uh, aqua jogging. So um, told me to buy a road bike and that got me hooked on cycling, which I did for two years. So I basically be just became a cyclist, learned really quick, raced uh, every other weekend for 18 months pretty much and um, off the back of that went to the um, uh, British Duathlon Champs at Presswold in Loughborough where Rick Vellati who is still a, um, a coach of British Triathlon uh, came up, up to me after the race where I finished third behind uh, I think it was Will Clark and Tim Don and said um, Bucko what's your swimming like I said crap um, and he said well we've got this uh this program, this tri goal program that wants to bring runners into the sport, do you fancy it? And then, yeah, I went from basically a full time job working for Timex uh, to starting triathlon um, full time uh, in, in Loughborough, and that was 2010. Uh, so at the ripe old age of 25, um, I had to kind of really upskill and um, learn how to swim. So they put me in that Loughborough pool every day for a year and um, trying to fast track me through everything. So uh, to give you an idea of kind of what that looked like, I, I, um, I had no ITU points or anything. So I had to spend the first year doing sort of continental cups um, and got enough points that within 18 months, I was on a World Series la uh, start line in Kitzbühel. Um, that coincided with um, it being about two months before the 2012 Olympics. And it was Alistair Brownlee's uh, comeback race from injury and um, so it's the first time I'd raced him having probably not raced him since we were on the fells 10 years earlier and um, I think he nearly lapped me um, so that was my sort of uh, welcome into the big stage but then I sort of um, stuck to it and um, I spent three years at Loughborough before I moved to Leeds to join the Brownlee group there and um, I've been in Leeds now eight years training alongside um, John and Alan, the Leeds Triathlon Centre squad. 
Um, but I, I figured I'd use this, um, you know, remaining five minutes uh, to bring up a few sort of key things that I've learned um, along the years that I thought, I guess, from a coaching point of view, might be interesting to some of you. Um, one thing that we've, um, that's quite, I guess, fresh in the mind is we've all been kind of through COVID and what, what I've learned through the last year um, from a sort of coach athlete point of view. Um, and that's around sort of competition. What we found, um, especially in Leeds, is a lot of the athletes that um, have kept competition at the forefront of everything that they do um, have actually mentally been in a better place for it. Um, obviously, we got to the point where we all realised there's a lot more going on in the world um, and racing wasn't necessarily the priority for everyone. Um, but what we found with a lot of athletes, they're athletes for a reason, they're driven, uh, they like routine, they like having a goal to work towards. And, and those that kind of kept racing um, were sort of, you know, you could just tell on a day-to-day -day basis they're a lot more chipper um, compared to athletes that probably can the season in sort of May time um, and maybe just just felt a little bit lost. Um, and, and I think that was right across the board. It's not just on the elite side. I coach a few age group athletes as well. And definitely um, for some of those guys, I set, um, you know, little four mile run uh, challenges and park run challenges and, you know, TT challenges. And that was a lot more rewarding. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a race. It just needs to have to be some element of competition. Um, uh, another point was um, what I learned from the guiding. Uh, so I started guiding, I think three years ago for Dave Ellis. Um, Johnny, Johnny Ryle asked me uh, about a week before Dave was due to race and didn't have a guide because his other guide had fallen off and broke his collarbone if I'd be up for it. Um, so I went down to Eaton Dorney, tried the, um, the tandem, thought it was okay and decided to do it. And uh, yeah, what a brilliant experience. Um, like a, a humbling experience more than anything when you kind of see a single arm amputee athlete changing a, a puncher on their own like uh yeah that that probably says it all um and being surrounded you know by such mo you know inspirational athletes on a day-to-day -day basis when we've done camps and stuff um they're just an absolute pleasure to be around uh, the para squad so um yeah that was a great experience i think it taught me a lot about communication um especially from a guiding point of view um, when I'm swim we're swimming along side by side and we go into a boy, I've got a shout to Dave um, to tell him to turn left or right. Um, on the bike, we kind of do like a three, two, one and, and right foot down as we're swinging into a corner. And then when you're on the run, you're kind of pot uh, pointing out potholes and curbs and things like that. Um, and yeah, so from that point of view, I, I, in, in triathlon, my sort of communication skills in terms from a coaching point of view, have never been something that I've really kind of focused on. And I realized how important having the communication and clarity was on that. Um, and then the final bit um, was um, I've put ask, ask athletes questions um, and what I've kind of what I've learned as I've transitioned from an athlete to a coach is um, I've had to learn really quick from day one, whether that was going out with the road club on my bike back in 2010 and, you know, wanting to race in three months time. I had to learn quick to, you know, trying to get points to qualify for the Olympic Games in 2012. Um, I've had to do everything quite quick. And I think a big part of that is I've asked a lot of questions along the way. Um, and similarly for the guiding, uh, you know, if I didn't understand stuff with Dave, I'd ask him straight away. And, and even now as I'm going into coaching, you know, I took this morning swim session, it was a fresh old session and I'm, I still find myself asking the athletes, you know, how could this be done better? Do you want better timing? Can I tell you it's hundred splits, things like that. And um, I think it's just, I put myself in the position of the athlete. It's a lot easier to do if you've been an athlete, but I remember kind of sat in the pool myself, like looking up at the coach going, yeah, I just wish, you know, that had been signaled better or you wrote bigger on the board uh, so I could actually see the set, you know, little things like that. And I think it's quite easy to forget as a coach that everything seems hunky-dory and an athlete just sat there um, not fully engaged or not, you know, fully on board with what's going on. 
And yeah, definitely a big part of what I've learned is just keep asking questions. Um, so that's specifically for coaching. But yeah, they were kind of like three points that I thought I'd bring to the table. And um, I think Gareth's got some questions for me as well. Yeah, Mike, it's really just to follow on from what you were saying there. You, you've obviously had that transition between being an elite athlete through to now your, your roles in coaching. What would you say are the biggest challenges that you faced in that transition between athletes and perhaps even still wanting to be out there on the track when you're when you're coaching your athletes still now? Yeah, I think um, when I did the athletes coach course specifically, you learn uh, basically athletes coach course. There was ten of us from all different sports that had all been athletes and transitioning to coaches so it was sort of really good to work with other um individuals from other sports um but a lot of that course was about reflection um about kind of going away and thinking about how things could be done better and my kind of mission statement for myself which we built up on that course over the 18 month period was i just want to add value and i didn't mean it by just turning up on poolside and holding a stopwatch but how can I kind of ask that athlete, how can I make that session better? How can I make the environment better and things like that? So I think it's, yeah, to answer your question, it's just um, being more reflective um, after the fact. So after the session is done, uh, genuinely just go, you know, t- take a moment with yourself and say, what could I have done better? But more importantly, again, I can't say it more, uh, ask the athlete how it can be done better. I don't even think, I know it's a bit, difficult for some you know like some coaches on here that are coaching young athletes and it be, it becomes a little bit uh harder because you you've got a lot more athletes and you're trying to run a big session and sometimes um you know kids are all over the place and stuff but even when I was like a young a young kid I had a real good run coach and 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 the debrief after the session was really good it was like how did that feel how does it compare to last week what do you think we can do better next week um and you don't always see that. So you've 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 spent a lot of time, obviously, with coaches in your athlete career. Is there anything that, looking back on on yourself in those in those days, maybe things you didn't appreciate that you do now as a coach to have to manage? So, is there looking back at your younger self, are there things that you wish you'd have done differently? Either asking some of those questions that you talked about, or just just pushed yourself in a different way is there anything that you can reflect back on now you're in that coach position yourself um yeah I think I think one of the hard things I've I found in groups over the years is um if the environment in in the group isn't like 100% how to get that right um and it's really hard I mean we've always kind of said that the group is the most important thing about our day-to-day triathlon life um, and again, that's right across the board to a young kid who goes to the local run club as well. Like they want to have a good environment and it's, um, and it's when you don't have that or you have like a few bad eggs or whatever, like how, how you deal with that. Um, and whether that's like, um, an athlete that's just like, uh, you know, hard to deal with or, an, an another coach or a fellow member of staff, um, it, it's still important that the group is the most important thing and um, you can't focus all your energy on that, you know, that one awkward child or, you know, that, that coach that you don't have a great relationship. You've got to um, really streamline to the whole group. So that's, um, that's Johnny Brown, the pulling faces at me. Ever the professional, we wouldn't expect anything less, would we? Um, just to obviously reflect on your experiences as somebody who's been coached by a range of different coaches what are the learnings that you've taken from any individuals that have coached you and either brought into your own coaching style or philosophy or you've seen and adapted that that fits to how you wish to operate um a real good one is um ian mitchell's our run coach currently and he was the protege of Malcolm Brown for years and years. And whenever you watch Malcolm, um, used to watch Malcolm at a session, especially a track session, he'd be always like on the infield. Um, and he'd be always pretty much on his own. And Mitch now does the same thing. And there's a lot in that. Like what, what we see sometimes is that, you know, the track's like 
hype on a Tuesday night and there's coaches and parents and everything. And the coach is trying to run the session with someone else talking in the rear. And those guys just separated themselves from that for that 20 minutes while the athlete needed them. And it kind of looks a bit like, oh, Mitch don't want to talk to me today. And, you know, oh, I don't want to talk to, you, you know, your dad or whatever. Um, but it's not. He's just all in on that session for 20 minutes and those like key athletes. Um, and I think that's brilliant. And I've seen, you know, other coaches do the same thing, but it's so easy to do it the other way. You know, we've all been on poolside, someone else walks in and, you know, there's an athlete's just lost in the session for 20 minutes um, because two coaches are talking to each other. So I think that's like, that's, that's really interesting. But again, it's all about balance as well. Obviously, coaches talking to other coaches is really important, but then there's a time and a place for that as well. Speaking of balance, it's there's there's that the, the physical side of coaching and training, and then there's the mental and psychological side of coaching and training. Do you have a preferred source uh, preferred of those two, or is it all about that balance and, and and dealing with the athlete's needs accordingly? Yeah, I think I think I'm getting there with a good balance. I'm not. I'm not quite there, um, but yeah, I'm kind of striving towards, actually, yeah, the more um, I've sort of thought about and sat down, like the balance between um, how much availability you're making yourself for athletes and sort of driving out into the dales with spare bottles and things like that. And, you know, sitting at home on training peaks and writing stuff like that as opposed, you know, and then being there at the session, giving like emotional support and things like that. There's definitely... Um, I don't quite have a method to my madness yet. And, and I think that's where I'll look at other coaches for that, for that guidance. And again, my athlete to coach course um, was really good on that because you had a complete mixed bag of 10 athletes that were kind of finding the feet. Um, and, but they all knew other coaches as well. And I don't, I don't think there's, yeah, there's obviously not one single way to, you know, the perfect way to coach. Um, but that, that balance is, um, definitely key i don't think i really answered your question very well but no it's probably one of those ones where there is no definitive answer because coaching is a, is a continually learning process so maybe you can show us how much of the the coaching life that you now lead how much do you concentrate on yourself almost as a percentage or as a, as a ratio that you concentrate on the athletes that you're you're coaching um Probably, I'm probably a bit too too more balanced the, towards the athlete. Um, you know, part of my motto was adding value and athlete first. He's got to be athlete first. It's not it's not about the it's not about the coach. And I know it's really hard for me to say that. I like I'm kind of classing myself as a coach now, and there's a lot of coaches on here. But like the two guys back there will go and train regardless if we've got a coach there or not. The coach is important, but the athletes, the key. And that, you know, it, I think you kind of got to be a bit unselfish on that point of view, providing that you communicate that you go, I'll put you first, but I still, you know, I need to look after number one as well. But, um, you know, I've all, always got your back. Um, so I guess, yeah, communication is really important from that point of view. So, you know, for instance, with, with John and Al, I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll do, um, 80% of the sessions while I'm on this camp, but I've got to take that Friday easy, um, you know, just for me, just to recoup. And as long as I've signaled that when it gets, you know, to tomorrow, um, they know that that's coming and they understand that. And it, without delving into the, into the coach athlete dynamic too much, how, how is that relationship between you and the athletes that you've previously trained with and competed against now that you're in that coaching position? How has that changed? Has it has it impacted the dynamic at all? Um, a little bit. I definitely needed to um, grow up a little bit. Um, I coached Gordon Benson and I trained alongside him for uh, five years until I became his coach. So um, that was a real interesting dynamic. Um, and um, yeah, for those that know Gordon Benson, is a you know a great athlete, interesting character. And I think a few people have said, if you can coach God, you can coach anyone. Um, so that it, it's been really good. And I took that um, with open arms, you know, wanting to support him. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I think I had to do a lot of growing up at the time rather than just, you know, cliche being one of the lads and just one of the group. You kind of got to have a bit more of that responsibility. Um, and the, the easiest way I could do that was when it came to camps and stuff, I took the lead on organising pool time, you know, uh, flights, transfers, you know, where we're getting physio and things like that. That was like an easy way for me to start, um, you know, managing the group um, rather than, yeah, just, just staying as an athlete. Cause it's right now, as it stands, it's quite easy for me to slip back into athlete. Um, but I'm at the moment I'm, I'm juggling, uh, and, but everyone in the group appreciates that I was supposed to retire after the Olympics. Um, but obviously, uh, it got postponed. So I'm, um, I'm still going. <laughs> Postponing that retirement for another year or so at least. So. Yeah. Mark, that, that's really good. And thank you for your time in, in chatting to us just, just now. Um, we've had a fair few questions come through on the chat. So if you're happy and willing to, to face some more questions, whether they're easier or harder, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to prejudge. I'll leave that up to you to decide. So starting from the, uh, starting from the top, um, I've got a question from Chris. Mark, I'd love to hear your views on strategies to transfer, transition, sorry, an athlete from age group to full time rather than going through a traditional talent identification pathway? Um, so is that, um, I guess, is that any athlete, uh, are we talking a young athlete? I'm not sure. I don't know if the person's online to um, Chris. If you yeah, can. Chris, if you want to unmute. Um, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah, can. yeah, it's Chris talking. So I have an athlete, she's 28, um, actually come from a horse riding background, um, has, has have a great aptitude for running like yourself, Mark. Um, mm -hmm. and decided to essentially um, stop her job working in finance in the city and become a full-time athlete at 28. So it's, 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 it's around that mindset of, um, I, I read the book by um, uh, uh, Steve, Steve Cracknell, not, um, uh, if not now, when, and um, she had the same mindset that she just wants to give it her best shot just to see if, it, if, it, if there's an opportunity within the sport. More of a longer distance though, so 70.3 is probably her her best her best distance yeah um i think to begin with i'd do a year of a hybrid i'd i'd um i'd, I'd try doing a bit of both and um, just from experience my my partner lucy hall went to the 2012 olympics and then when covid hit she de, um she's actually a, a full-time covid officer now while she's training so she's doing 25 hours um covid officing and um and 25 hours of training um so it's a 50 hour week yeah we don't have kids so it's easy but um uh or easier but she's got quite a good balance there and she's planning on still racing um even though she's probably not going all in um and so for an athlete who's just working full time um and then wanting to you know wanted to go to his triathlete full time i think it's financially it can be a big gamble um, it depends what the support looks like from that point of view. Some people have career breaks and gap years and stuff and the finances there. And I just say, yeah, go for it. But sometimes that creates a little bit of pressure. There's a lot of people around you, family, friends, employees, uh, colleagues um, that might go, what, you know, what the hell are you doing? And then you are kind of doing it all to prove them wrong. Whereas you kind of want to be doing it for yourself. Um, so I, yeah, um, it's quite a hard question to, to answer, but I'd say, um, yeah, do a hybrid of both for a year, see how that goes. If you still got great potential to move into it full time, then yeah, go for it. Why not? Um, you never know when your last race is going to be, eh? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, on this particular athlete, actually, uh, it doesn't have much kind of financial constraints, so that's she's very lucky in that perspective. So um, yeah, it was more. It was more around. How, how would you begin to make that transition? Because we, we, we talk different strategies around, obviously looking at volume and intensities, um, getting a greater support network. So more experts in different areas that would be outside my domain as a coach. So in looking at more physiotherapists uh, to take care of that perspective, looking at nutritionists to take a lot more care of that. Um, is there any other people do you think that we should look for support? Um. The, the would be the answer to that would be um however what i say to a lot of people and this kind of ties in quite well to british triathlons like a vision moving forward um of 
um, world-class basics uh, and world-class culture, but in particular basics, um, get the basics right first before you bring in all the marginal gains because a lot of those things are the marginal gains. Ultimately, in triathlon, it's an endurance sport. The hours is king. Um, so if you can get an athlete towards, you know, uh, over 20 hours at least, 25 hours would be ideal. Um, get to that point over two or three months um, and then really refine that, make those sessions better. Um, and then once you get to set six months and then you start racing and you see how that goes, then it's probably a good time to bring in all those other things because otherwise you kind of, I think sometimes you get tripped up on what, what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, this camp here, other than having the luxury of someone cooking full time, is pretty basic. Um, we just go and do the three disciplines each day and try and, you know, see what the, the swim coach sends to us. I'm going to do that this week, try and nail it and then try and, you know, improve it slightly next week. But, um, you know, we're not doing loads on aero testing and nutrition strategies and things like that. And I, I know I appreciate we, we have done some of that stuff in the past, but we, we've got to go back to basics every time and get that stuff right as well. Chris, thanks so much for your question. And, and, and Mark, thank you for, your, for answering that. Uh, we've yeah, just got, got, a, got a few more to, uh, to, to address. So I've got a question from Amy. Um, reflecting on the UK Sport Coach Programme that you've talked about, what do you think your biggest learning from that was? Um, I think the similarities in um, the themes across all different sports, um, even though, you know, I was, I was sat in a room with, uh, let's say, coaches from uh, judo, um, cycling, uh, badminton, all, all sorts of sports, rowing, and then, um, there was all like real similar themes and um and yeah some crazy one of the, the craziest story was i'll give you the um the inside scoop there was a tri, uh, quite taekwondo i can't say it taekwondo coach who basically retired so it was at the same point as me and then got asked to coach uh, a double olympic gold medalist um and and so what came out of that was like yeah a year's worth of yeah a uh, hot topic it was great um but yeah it was just kind of like those sharing of stories and go right well how do you do that um you know and do a bit of a round the table thing like how is that possible that someone who hasn't been coaching before can you know coach someone at that level um and yeah i don't think there's one particular thing but there was just like so many little stories like that and uh an interest that we that we um that, that we could share Brilliant. And I've one or two more, and um, I know we're slightly over. So as long as you're okay, then we'll we'll, we'll put another one in. I have a question from Jan, I think. Um, working with the paratri team, what's the biggest thing that you've learned from in from being in that setting, and what advice would you potentially give to somebody who's coaching paratri athletes? Um, I think. Uh... Yeah, to begin with, um, there was like a few, uh, you know, how you approach a, a para triathlete kind of needs to be um, slightly different to a to an able-bodied athlete, uh, just because, well, unless you don't, you know, if you've had no experience whatsoever, which I didn't, um, you know, there's little things like, you know, I said to, you know, to Dave, like, do I have to guide you into the room on when to go for a race briefing and things like that? And um, again, I, I sort of come back to that whole communication point of view. I, I asked him so many times and, um, you know, uh, we're working with um, all the athletes uh, on the para side, you just, you just learn, yeah, they're just such a great uh, bunch of people. And um, even though you've got to kind of respect that, you know, bundling all into a van takes a little bit longer and things like that. Most of it's like the same. Um, you're dealing with performance high-end athletes um, and, they were, and they were a great bunch. Um, but yeah, in particular, like the, yeah, the biggest thing was just to, if we could refine a few skills, um, I think it would have been, a, my answer would have been different if it was a different athlete that I had worked with. Because basically you say, you ask Dave, um, how was that? And he doesn't really give you much feedback. And you ask Dave, can we make that, you know, how can we make that better? And he just kind of shrugs his shoulders. 
Um, so that was like a real interesting point for me. Um, but yeah, it's such a pleasure to work with. You know, I just want the guy to do well. Um, but there was a few things we did re refine. You know, I, I kind of said, would it be better if I count down into going around the corner? And he was like, actually, it's quite good. Yeah, because then we've both got our bottom pedal at the bottom at the same time and you don't try and press against each other um, and little things like that. And the same on the, the going around the boy. If we can be half a second quicker because I've shouted, yep, as I'm breathing to the side um, and you turn that fractional early um, and we, you know, we can gain a, an extra second here and there, then that's, that's brilliant. Um, we just did a bunch of things like that. You know, we found ways that we could actually, when, when you're tethered in the swim, you're super close to each other. Uh, and the rules, I think your head can't be more than a metre and a half apart. And I said to Dave, like, the further apart we are, the faster we'll swim, because otherwise we're just catching the same water and hitting each other. So, you know, we drifted apart a little bit within the rules still and found that we could swim a lot quicker. Um, and yeah, I, my, my, my degree when I was in the States was economics. So it's all about efficiency and I just can't let hold of that. So it's all uh, transferable skills at the end of the day, yeah. isn't it? One, yeah. one, final, one final one. I'm very conscious that we're, we're a little bit over now. Um, have you got any final tips or bits of training advice to give to a full time amateur? Um, if you say recently retired from your profession, and want to be the, the best that you can be, what would be your top two or three things that you would advise? Um, first off, you've, like, you've got to enjoy it. I, I say to any age group, and I, actually when I just I used to coach Tej, as just popped up on the chat, um, I, always, I, I say to every age group athlete, you've got to enjoy it. Like, it's your hobby. Like, go to work, let that be the hard bit. Sometimes the family likes the hard bit as well. Like, enjoy the sport, like you've got to do. Like, like maximize that, um, throw in as many competitions as possible. I think um, I've listened to quite a lot of podcasts in lockdown and uh, loads on Greg, Greg Bennett's podcast and everyone that he has like past and present, you know, Olympic medalists and stuff, they all say the same thing. I wish I'd race more. And I don't think that stops with the age group athletes either, you know, like book those races in, um, do as many as you can. You learn so much from it. Um, you know, there's a big thing with a lot of age group athletes about A races and B races and stuff like that. And all of a sudden you put loads of pressure on one race, just go enter one in a couple of weeks time. Like you'll be fine, you'll enjoy it, you'll learn loads, like, and you'll love just being out there. Um, well, we'll finish on, on one of your, uh, one of your people there. So Tej saying, do you miss the racing side more since you've started coaching more? Is there still that little flicker yeah, inside? I don't know. I kind of... <sighs> I don't miss racing the World Series. To be honest, I kind of, after I got pummeled for four years uh, racing World Series, my best result was fourth in Yokohama. I won a World Cup and stuff, but I, it, it was probably a level above me. Um, my swim just wasn't strong enough, so I don't miss racing the World Series stuff. It was just so, it was just so difficult, and it was just like, I'm going to have a terrible race, so I'm going to have a good one. Like, yeah. And I didn't enjoy that bit of it. Um, and, and to be honest, my body's letting me down more and more. I've had, since I was supposed to retire last September, I've had, I've had two surgeries. Um, so if that ain't telling me something, I don't know what is. And, and, and actually, I, I, I find it really rewarding coaching as well. I, I, I kind of like that side. I think when I'm coaching, I'm going to limit myself to 10 hours of training a week. I've wrote a little training plan already, like the perfect 10 hours. Um, and I'm going to do that. So an hour uh, a day during the week and then five hours over the weekend, that, that, that's all I'm going to do. And already the lads are saying, yeah, you could probably do like 15 or 20 and da, da, da. And I was like, yeah, I just, yeah, um, spread myself too thin. So um, okay. I've already got a plan and I'm looking forward to it. The perfect 10 hours plan by Mark Buckingham coming to a bookshop near you in about three years time. So that's that's all something to look forward to. Um, Mark, I'm going to finish off there. Thank you so much and do for your time and for answering all the questions. I hope everyone's really enjoyed that session. Um, and a, just a, a huge thank you from all of us here for, for coming and spending some time with us all the way from the United States. It's really appreciated. Cheers. Thank you. Well, thanks all for having me.